Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm super excited for today's guest. But before we get into all the good sales and strategy from our guest, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co host, Six Sigma, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net landmoto.com and most importantly for not automating your craigslist and your facebook postings posting domination.com forward slash the land geek i do remind everybody today's podcast is sponsored by geekpay.io the only automated financial crm in the country a set it and forget it system guaranteed to get you paid one way or the other our guest is i'm gonna put on my on my anchorman voice he's a big deal Steve Yastro is a nonstop idea generator, business advisor, and best-selling sales author. When he's not creating new ideas for his books and other writings, he's thinking about how to apply his ideas to his clients' businesses. In 1997, Steve became unemployable. He opted out of a career as a senior marketing executive in the hospitality industry to form Yastro and Company. And now Yastro and Company has enabled Steve to help organizations of all types improve their results through his breakthrough marketing, customer relationship, and sales ideas. Steve Astro, how are you? I'm doing great, Mark and Scott. Nice to talk to you. I'm, I'm really excited um, about this podcast simply because um, you're kind of like, like a combination of like a, like a TED Talk high-level thinker combined with like the real-life practical strategies of somebody that knows how to like get things done and increase revenues by sales. Is that a good description? What an astute observation, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I like to think that way. I mean, we need theories and, and intellectual frameworks to make decisions. Then we have to bring those down to the ground level and use them to make money. And that's what I do. So if we rewind the tape, right, we go back to 1996. What was it that allowed you the confidence to be like, you know what, I'm going out on my own? It's a great question. I was the vice president of resort marketing at Hyatt Hotels. I was responsible for marketing all these beautiful resorts in Hawaii and the Caribbean and some of the sunnier places in the continental U.S. And when I got there, I inherited a really big advertising budget. And what I realized pretty quickly doing some research is that the love of our customers had very little to do with that big advertising budget. It had to do with how the entire experience of being a guest at one of our resorts created this really compelling story about why you want to be a guest. And it was such a compelling observation. I realized one day that the real marketing wasn't coming from the marketing department, in the corporate office. It was coming from the bellman and the pool guys and the front desk clerks who were there on the ground delivering a great experience. And so what that led me to was the idea that marketing and sales are not what we think they are. They're what our customers think they are and everything we do tells our story. And so it led me to, my first book and the concept I built my business on, which I call Brand Harmony, which says that if you can create a compelling customer experience where every point of contact is part of contributing to that experience, that's when your customers love you. And it's, that's what gave me the confidence to do it. And that's what we've built everything on since then. I, I, I love that Brand Harmony idea. Um, Steve, can you think of, a, of an example of where you had both experiences, where you went in and from every touch point, they exceeded your expectations and you felt compelled to maybe go on Yelp and leave an amazing five-star review and the opposite situation where that you just felt like there's no love here. Oh, you know, certainly. If I think of, as you say that, I'm thinking of the great experience of brand harmony, what came to mind. I remember 10 years ago, I went for the first time to a resort in Mexico called Rancho La Puerta. My mom had been going there for years and she brought my brother, my sister and all the rest of us she brought us down there and I was like, this place is awesome. And every part of that experience told this great story about a wonderful resort where you can chill out and get healthy. Every single touch point. In fact, I loved it so much. By the third time I went there, I made them my client. <laughs> um, so their secret to great loyalty was just that every single aspect of the experience from when you get greeted at the airport to when you show up at the resort, when you eat their food and go to their fitness classes and take their mountain hikes all told this great story. That's a great example of Rand Harmony. And then I can't help but think about, um, you know, an example 
of a lack of brand harmony right now. I mean, think of what our friends at United Airlines have been through in the last couple of months, you know, fly the friendly skies and they're dragging people off airplanes. We've all got lots of examples like that. And what it tells us is that brands aren't, and, and customer love isn't formed just by what we say, it's formed by what we do, which, you know, really led me to focus on the human aspects of marketing and sales, how the way your employees interact with your customers, the way your salespeople engage customers is really what tells your story much more powerfully than the inanimate objects like brochures and websites and even social media posts. They count, but the human contact for most companies is what really makes the difference. Scott Todd, you, you've, you've lived Steve's life. Scott came from a Fortune 300 background. Yeah, also in the hospitality. Well, more, where, where? more in the travel, more in the yeah. travel piece. What are you doing? I was a v, VP at Hertz. Oh, wow. um, so, you know, that, that customer experience was so important. Uh, and you're right. When you see, when you see the, um, when you see it in the culture, it, it, it goes down to the customer, right? Like it, it's not, everything starts really with the employees and really the frontline employees. It's not necessarily that, that brand message or the marketing message. I mean, the, the marketing would be great to say, Hey, look, we're, we're, we're nice. I, if we continue to pick on United, you know, like, Hey, look, we're, we fly, uh, fly the friendly skies. However, when it comes down to execution, it's really the people on the front lines that, that dictate that and they set the direction. And really at the end of the day, that comes from the culture of the company. Well, it, it, it's so true. And it's like, that's why, I mean, I tend to look at the employees of a company as being the most important marketing medium. And we, one of the things that we talk about a lot is that your, your external brand, your, your brand in the marketplace can never be better than your internal brand. And so if you want to have a strong, powerful brand in the marketplace, you better make sure that inside the company, your employees completely get it and are enthusiastic about the actions they take to deliver on your promises. And it's amazing how many companies just never focus on that. It's kind of why I have a business. You know? Yeah, but Steve, why, why is that? I mean, you know, I, I love the fact that you're saying ditch the pitch, which mm -hmm. I'd like you to expound on. But Yeah, please. So let's talk about that, but let's also talk about why is it so hard? It seems so simple to just care, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's not. And, and what, what gets in the way? Well, companies are fragmented in many cases. They're na the natural thing is to be in silos, which is too bad, but it's true. And so what happens is if you go into many companies, the marketing departments are operating, believe it or not, even separately from sales. So they might have all this work on their brand and it's manifesting itself on their website and their digital marketing and their print marketing and their advertising. But they're not really talking to the salespeople about how to communicate the brand. And even more so, the marketing department has both no interest and no jurisdiction in the employees understanding their role in dealing with the brand. So I go to a lot of companies, I see this is a huge opportunity. And when I can get all employees in a company to understand their role in delivering the brand promise and expand the marketing department's jurisdiction to be focused on this internal marketing it makes a big difference, but it's kind of a blinder that most companies have on themselves. And one of the challenges is that even if you lift the blinders, then you've got the silos and, and um, you know, operations executives who don't want to take direction from marketing, et cetera. So there's, there's problems, but I'll tell you something. It's the companies that can get over that challenge that have a huge advantage for a really simple reason. Brand harmony isn't the way marketing works because Steve says so. It's my observation of this is the way customers evaluate companies. If the entire experience come together, they say, I get it. I love that company. If the promises from marketing and the promises from sales and the delivery from operations are different, what's going to happen? The customer's not going to pay attention to them. So the companies that can overcome that challenge have a wonderful competitive advantage. Yeah. It reminds me of Scott Todd. He goes to First Watch, right? And he walks in and they know his name and they know, they know what he's going to order, right? Very simple thing but really powerful because if he's going to look at going somewhere else for like a, you know, a meal, he's going to keep going back to the place that he feels like they really care. Well, this, this is a really important point. Where do you go to first watch, Todd? Scott? Scott? Where, where in Florida? In Florida. Okay. Cause I had my, my daughter when she was living in Cincinnati, we go to first watch all the time. We don't have them here in Chicago. What's interesting about that experience is imagine you know, first watch for those who are listening don't know they have you know, wonderful breakfast and lunch too. But like, I think it's a breakfast place. And let's assume that you got a first watch in your town and Scott can go to like 
five other places to get a great omelet that's just as good as the omelet at First Watch. But when he goes into First Watch, they know who Scott is and he's formed a relationship with them. Where do you think he's going to go? And this is, to me, this can lead us into your, your question about Ditch the Pitch, which is that I have seen over and over that when customers love a company, relation, they think the company's different, relationships are so frequently much more differentiating than products or services. In other words, five great omelets, but the one you have a relationship with is the one you're loyal to. And it makes sense why. I mean, the omelet's about First Watch or the other diner. The relationship involves Scott. So, gee, what do you think Scott cares about more? First Watch and their omelet or Scott? He cares about himself. So when his frame of reference is the relationship I have with this restaurant in this case, he's involved in that relationship. So, of course, it's more important to him than an omelet. So relationships are highly differentiating. This is something that we can never forget. And as we start to take advantage of these wonderful digital marketing tools, let's not forget that they're wonderful, but that we are still human beings and we are still driven by the relationships in our lives. We're really social, social creatures. Let's never forget that. So Steve, let's talk about ditch the pitch. Please. I love talking about ditch the pitch. What, you know, how did that come about? And then what, what does that mean? So I just talked about relationships as differentiators. My first, my second book I wrote after brand harmony was called we, the ideal customer relationship. And it's how to, engage with customers in a way that their frame of reference is we as opposed to us and them. And that's sort of a concept for any employee to be able to build a relationship with a customer. A subset of that is what happens when a salesperson is trying to persuade a customer to do lots of things, give you the first meeting, give you information, invite you to do a proposal, accept your proposal, refer you to other people, et cetera. That if you wanna have your customers engage with you you can't do it by just pitching at them. I mean, how do, how do you feel when somebody lays a sales pitch on you? You don't feel good. And the fact of the matter is, it's probably not going to work, or it's definitely not going to work. Because if somebody preconceives what they want to say to you before they meet you, the odds it's the right thing are about, about zero, right? One in a billion that they're going to hit the target. So ditch the pitch is a concept that I developed out of my work with helping people learn how to engage with customers, specifically focus on sales. It says some, some very simple but effective things. The first idea is that you wanna turn every presentation into a conversation. Don't present, converse. Even when a customer asks you a question in the middle of a conversation, don't present your answer, frame it as a conversation for a number of reasons. One is people are much more engaged in a conversation than when they hear a presentation. In a presentation, the customer's in passive mode, judgment mode. When they're engaged in a conversation, they are engaged. They're participating with you in, in coming to the conclusion they should buy from you. So turn every presentation into a conversation. And to do that, you have to, when you ditch the pitch, you're improvising, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, you have to be present. You can't just go by rote script, right? I mean, you have to be completely present. That's the first, in fact, the first thing we teach and ditch the pitch is called be alert. It's be completely present with your customer. Nothing in the world could distract you. That's when it works. In fact, I, I live in Chicago, which you and I, many of your listeners might know is the world capital of stage improvisation. Second city. Second city, yeah. I could go tonight if I wanted to. There are so many, so many improv shows I could see. You know, in LA, all the, the waiters and waitresses are wannabe movie stars. In Chicago, all the waiters and waitresses are currently improv actors. I mean, there's so there's thousands of them. It's great. So what I did was I interviewed a lot of uh, actors from Second City and other theaters and a lot of improvising musicians also to understand the secrets of improvisation. And what you find is that the tools that five people who've never met before can go on a stage and improvise a scene, which I guarantee you is happening in Chicago tonight, the way they do it is with the tools that I translated to teach salespeople how to improvise to create a conversation that really matters to the customer. And you, know, you nailed it, Mark. The first step is you got to be completely alert. We teach people to, to ditch the pitch. The first habit we teach them is to, is to develop the habit of thinking input before output. Most salespeople think about what they want to say. No, what you want to say comes later. First, what do you want to understand? What do you want to observe? What do you want to hear? And that requires 
acute alertness and presence. So, okay, like, let's pick on Scott for a second here because he's got the attention span of a, of a ferret and a double cappuccino, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and the reason being, I'm, and I'm just joking because I'm, I'm really more like that. Um, and, and the reason is, is, is the, the damn iPhone, right? Oh, so. Um, <laughs> so it's almost like um, it's hard in a way today to not be distracted and oh, to be completely yeah. present. So how do we get in that mindset? Like, like, how do we do this? Well, you know, we do live in the most distracting time in the history of the human race. You know, we evolved to be alert to the lion that might pop out of the bushes, but not to have the kind of, you know, so that's a distraction we're lucky we don't have anymore. But we have so many distractions. In fact, the only time in the history of humanity that's more distracting than right now is now. You know, it keeps getting worse, right? And so we have to be aware of that and, and dispose of the myth that we can multitask. We can't multitask. We do something that it's called time slicing. It's going back and forth. So if you're on the phone with a customer and you spend a moment checking out that new email that just came in from another customer, guess what? You weren't multitasking. You stopped listening to the customer on the phone and you might miss a gift he gives you that tells you how to close him. So you have to recognize that the world is more distracting than we've evolved to deal with and make an active practice of being focused on your customer. Don't worry about that next meeting or what you're going to say next even or something else you're going to do after work today. Focus only on this customer because you need your customer to do the same thing. You need your customer, your goal in ditching the pitch. Our model is that I want your customer so engaged with you that they're not thinking about anything else in their life and they're so engaged, they're sharing this deep information with you that's going to help you sell them and they're very interested in what you have to say. And how do you expect to get your customer fully engaged with you unless you're fully engaged? Scott Todd. The first of many steps. Well, I was going to say, like, the, the one thing I think a lot of people think is that you have to have that conversation going back and forth, right? Like, you, you know, like, it, people, people have, uh, there's uncomfortableness in silence. Right. And so, you know, like, you, you may not always have the exact thing to say, especially when you're listening and not trying to think ahead. Well, I'm going to say this, or I'm going to say that. And so now you, now you become kind of a thinker and it's okay to say, oh, that's interesting. Let me, let me think about that for a second and then to think through and then go on with the conversation. But I think that a lot of times people are already aiming up and, and reloading, like you're saying, they're reloading what they're going to say next. Totally. And they might miss that one little thing, that one thing that you felt like, if I feel like it's important and you're going to thinking like, I'm going to say this to him then you could miss that one piece of nugget that I give you that, like you said, could, could, could sell me or could, could close me. It's okay to ponder for a moment. You're having an authentic, real human conversation. That would happen if you're having a deep conversation with a friend, wouldn't it? It's okay. And in fact, you're right. If you're so geared up about what you're going to say next, you could not only miss what the customer is going to say, you could close off the path to the wonderful, amazing thing that they're going to say that could help you close them. You know, we have a, one of the practices in Ditch the Pitch is called obey the one paragraph rule. The one paragraph rule says whenever you've said about a paragraph's worth of information, and imagine a small paragraph in a book, stop and leave a break. The customer might say something, they might ask you a question, but even if you just give them a moment of silence to absorb what you've said, that's good. You've invited them to keep it a dialogue and you've prevented yourself from monopolizing the conversation with a monologue, which is the death knell of any sales conversation. You know, it's interesting because we've had a, a sales trainer on and he, he made the argument that a great salesman is a combination of an actor that has a script and knows that script so well, we believe that they're that person and a talk show host where they're asking questions and they're engaged. And the combination of the two make for a, a really compelling sales conversation. What, what would you say to that? I'd say two things, and I, I, I don't know the sales trainer, and I want to be careful not to, not to criticize anybody else I don't know, but, but when I hear that as a concept, I have a couple thoughts, which is that scripts do not work because you can't possibly write a script. That's, even if it's a customer you've known for years and you talk to him two hours ago and you show up at his office, you know what happened in the last two hours. You've got to be open to the nuances of what's new, and it's especially true with a new customer. You can't have a script. You can know your stuff. 
You can have all the elements of your script, bro script broken into little pieces in your pocket that you pull out at the right time, but you can't have a script. I'd say an improv actor, yes. A scripted actor, no. The talk show host metaphor is an interesting one because a lot of sales training methodologies do teach us to ask questions. And that's great. Questions are wonderful. But you want to be careful not to interview your customer because that feels like pressure and a pitch. I'd say the talk show host I tell you to be like is go Google some old John Stewart episodes of The Daily Show and watch him with another comedian on. It's complete improv. And it's based on the fundamental principle of improv, which is called yes and. Whatever one person offers, the other person takes it and builds on it. And that's what you do with your customer is just keep this flowing dialogue where you're building on what, it, what the other person says. And if you do that, your customer will be so engaged with you that you'll be able to navigate the conversation in the right place. So I would say don't get rid of the script and be careful not to just interview. Make sure it's an authentic human conversation, real natural conversation. I, I really like that line of thinking. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? I, you know, I, I agree. I think that, I think it's important that you know your stuff. I think that's, you know, when, when I think when that particular person said script, that's kind of what I thought got out of it, Mark. It's not that it was necessarily like you always have these lines that you always read and, and go here. I think it's more of, you know, you, you know, kind of some things that you can say in order to keep the conversation moving because what a lot of people, especially in sales, like, I mean, like Tom, I think the movie Tommy boy, even brings us out, you know, like he doesn't know what more to say. And he's like, okay, thank you. And he gets up and leaves, right? As opposed to continue, having a way of continuing that conversation, having a way that you can continue to add value to that relationship. Because there's always a way to continue the conversation. I mean, it happens in our personal lives. You know, it's, it's, it's a natural thing. I mean, I always remind myself that humans invented conversation and language. We started having conversations 100,000 years ago. And PowerPoint's been around for about 20. So what do you think is more natural for people, you know, watching a PowerPoint or being in a dialogue? And so let's recognize that in our, in our daily lives, we are wired for conversation. We're wired to be social beings who interact and create relationships through dialogue. That's what works. So why not use it with your customers? Why use a very unnatural form of human communication, the, the presentation slide deck? You can have your deck, but use it to frame a conversation, not to make a presentation. I, I, I yeah, it's 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 great advice. I, I want to pivot and talk about latent profit. Thank you. Latent about profit that. and and the six recalibration questions. Um, first, the first question is, what led you to create these six recalibration questions, and then kind of expound on what this does and how this. Um, can actually move the needle in your company. Sure, well, so here, here's, here's the idea. Um, in the history of the world, no company has ever made all the money it possibly could. You know, Microsoft in 1999 still could have made more, right? Exxon Mobil, whenever gas prices, oil prices were the highest, still could have made more. There's always potential. And everybody listening to this podcast works in a business or owns a business or runs a business that could make more money. That's latent profit, that untapped potential that when realized not only helps you make more money this year, it helps you make a more valuable company in the future. We just gotta know where, to, where to, to mine for these riches. So the questions you wanna ask is first of all, where is that latent profit? Where is the potential? I go into companies all the time as an advisor and a consultant and I see that so often the pot of gold's over in one place but all the marketing, sales, product development are aiming in different directions. So you gotta first know where is that untapped potential? Next question is, okay, what customer action will unleash that latent profit? One of the things we have to realize, it's kind of a very humbling thing, is to realize that none of us creates the profits in our business. Our customers do. You know, we can all create great plans and great ideas and create new products. We don't make money until customers buy them, refer us, pay our prices. So you want to also ask your question, after you know where the latent profit is, what are the customer actions that will unleash that latent profit. Because if you think about it, sales and marketing, they are not about websites and brochures and PowerPoints and social media posts. Sure, those things come in. Sales and marketing are the things that we do to encourage our customers to act in ways that drive our results. So ask yourself the question, what is it you want your customer do to do that will result in unleashing latent profit in your business? 
The next question you want to ask is, why would customers take those actions? Well, to me, your brand is not what you say you are. Your brand is what your customers think you are because actions create, or excuse me, beliefs create actions. Ralph Waldo Emerson said something wonderful. He said many wonderful things. He said the ancestor of every action is a belief, right? So if customer action drives your profits, what beliefs will drive those actions? So the next question is, what do your customers believe about you right now? Because if I want to know what your brand is, I don't look at your website, I find out what your customers are thinking. And the next question is, what do you want your customers to think? Because I guarantee you, for everyone listening here, there's a gap between what your customers are thinking now and what you like them to think. So to me, the fundamental question of branding is, what do you want your customers to think that if they thought it, they would act in ways that drive your results? So we've done four questions. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. I, I, I love the fact that you're, you know, you're thinking so big and deep with all these things. My, my question is, will this apply to smaller businesses or is this only apply to big companies? No, in fact, in fact, here's the point. I think smaller companies have a great advantage when you think this way. And here's why. If you think about, go back to what we said about brand harmony, which asks the question, what customer experience will create these beliefs you want your customers to have? When you recognize that what gets customers to love you isn't how big your advertising budget is or how you were able to hire a big ad agency to create the slickest creative, but what really creates love from your customers is how every experience customers have with you, whether it's your salespeople, your marketing, your operations, your product, et cetera, customer service, how every experience blends to tell one story. It's the small companies that now have an advantage. In a world where brand harmony and the entire customer experience defines how customer love is created, all of a sudden the big companies are at a disadvantage. They have too many employees and too many departments. It's harder for them to create brand harmony. Who can create brand harmony better? A little Italian restaurant in the corner in your town or Olive Garden with what, 1,600 restaurants and a big advertising budget. So I actually think this mode of thinking creates a competitive a level playing field that actually favors the smaller company. You know, you know it's interesting. Um, I had a, a very negative experience uh, this weekend with a client where my client goes on, he asks for support and the support guy is in a horrible mood gives them just like these terrible answers and like they're fighting online, right? To the point where the client is like, I'm going to blow up at this guy. And before I do, I want Mark to know how I'm being treated, right? So I get this email, it's Saturday night. I immediately, I get the email and I think to myself, well, you know, what, what, what would I want if I was having this frustrating conversation with somebody on staff, right? So I, I just pulled over and I called the customer and I immediately apologized, right? And, you know, and we solved it together. It took about, it was like a 15 minute call. At the end of the conversation, he said, Mark, don't ever change, right? It really made an impact, right? Um, and I, I th- it's, it's almost like, what a gift that I had a, the opportunity to do that, where if it was a big company, I don't know if it would have yeah. gotten to me. Yeah, when I was a vice president at Hyatt, by the time one of those problems got to my desk, I don't mean to sound like I was some big executive, but there's a number of layers removed from the, the front desk clerk who, who gave the bad service, right? Or whatever it was. It had been so long and so much bureaucracy between the customer and me that like, shame on us. But in a smaller company, you have the opportunity to be much closer to the customer and react. Yeah, but you know, Scott, I know, I know what you're thinking. This this doesn't scale. Oh, well, I, like I, I think, like I, I think that no matter what, and and um, it's just like Steve just said, you know, like at some point, you would hope that someone along the way stops it. But I can tell you, you know, like when 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 I was a VP you would be surprised how many things don't get stopped on its way to you. And, you know, like I was always the kind of guy, like I'll take care of it right now. Right. Like it doesn't need to go any further than me, but I'm not, I don't scale. Right. So then you would Mark, you would be surprised how many times in a big company, these things, they don't, they just continue to like, you just look at, you're like, how idiotic. Why did we not, why did, why did it take five people to solve this problem? One person could have solved this problem. Totally. 
And so, you know, so, sometimes it's, it's, it's important that you, you know, that y- like you have to re- realize no matter how big you get, you're still going to get some of these things. Right. Yeah. I mean, Steve, the question then is at, so, at what, at the point where you don't scale, right. Um, what do you do then as the leader of your company to make sure that your vision scales, the, the ideas of, well, okay, I can't call, you know, a hundred customers on a Saturday night that are disgruntled if, if I've got, you know, 10,000 employees or whatever it is, right? Let's take United Airlines example, like the CEO is going to get on the call in the phone and call all those people. Um, right. What can, what can we do so that the, the, the values, the, the vision sure. goes and, and seeps through? So here's my thought on that. Let's, let's go back to the concept of improvisation. We talked about ditch the pitch. Now think about a frontline employee dealing with a customer. Um, how do you empower them? Not only empower them, but you can give permission, but how do you equip them to know what to do? So a lot of companies have missions and visions and values, and that's nice and they're wonderful. But my observation is twofold on that is that most employees can't tell you what the mission and values are. And the next thing is they're like, so what am I supposed to do about this? So what we've found is that you want to translate your mission and values into verbs, actions, habits that you want your employees to take. So we will create what we call brand habits or brand actions in a company that, are, that define here are the behaviors we take to deliver a compelling experience for our customers. By the way, we found the best way to create those kind of that set of actions is to involve employees in, in interactive sessions, help them define what they can do to deliver a great customer experience. Here's what happens. When you can come up with a set of, let's say, five to eight actions that define, here's how we do business here. This is the way we serve our customers, the way we serve our colleagues inside the company. Your employees then have a set of tools that will help them know what to do when somebody, you know, calls into support and they're being a pain in the ass, your support guy knows what to do. When somebody walks up to your front desk of your hotel with a, with a problem, your employee will know what to do. So it's not only empowerment in terms of permission, it's empowerment in terms of equipping your employees with a set of verbs, actions, habits that they can take to live your company's promise with customers. That's when your employees will know what to do and it won't go through 17 people and finally get to the VP who gives, you know, the same solution that could have been done at the first step. It's, it's, it's really good. Uh, it's really good stuff, Steve Yastro. I have Thank to tell you. you. So unfortunately, we're at that point in the podcast now where um, we got to put you on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week. I, I, I think, Scott Todd, can we talk to Steve for like another hour? Is I think so, way? yeah. We're going to have to have you back, Steve. But I have to do, have to do that. Okay, so I'll get tip of the week. Let's go back to ditch the pitch for a minute. And we talked about a few tips I could have given already, so I want to give you another one that's really, really valuable. Because your customer cares about you a whole lot more, who cares about himself or herself a whole lot more than they care about you, right? No doubt. They care about themselves when they care about us. The tip is this, whenever you are in a conversation with a customer, focus 95% of the subject matter of the conversation on the customer. I'm not saying they talk 95% of the time. You want your customer to talk more than 50%, but make sure even when you're talking, 95% of the subject matter is about the customer. The irony is if you want your customer to understand your story, talk about his or her story, not your story, because they are more likely to understand you within the context of a conversation about them. 95% of the conversation is about the customer, not about you. That's my tip for the week. Great tip. Phenomenal mentorship, Steve Astro. Um, this is great. This is great. Scott Todd, I hate to do this to you, but it's time for another tip of the week. All what right, do you, Mark. What do you got? Here's what I got. Uh, check out the website, K-E-E-E-B, Keeb. Keeb.com. I think that's it. K E E three B three E's. K E E E B three B. Yeah, three E's. Dot com. All right. So, okay. So look, this this thing is pretty cool. It is. Uh, no wait, that can't be it. Hold on, man. Unleashing I, enterprise intelligence? No, 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 no. Hold, hold on. It's uh, hold on, hold on. This is not <laughs> right. I thought I had it up. Hold on. Uh, it's a it's a Chrome plugin. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, plug in. So I'm, I'm Googling to get the right piece. Uh, yeah, if that is it, it's, so I guess you have to go to, so like, yeah, go to, um, the, 
you got to get the Chrome plugin. Then you create your account. Now, look, here's it's it's Chrome, Firefox, Safari. It's all of the browsers. Okay. Okay. Basically, what this does is, if you can imagine, like, uh, you know how in Evernote you can, if you're on a website or something, you can just like do a screen, like a web clip or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, this allows you to clip a part of the the screen, and it stores it into your Keeb account. Okay. Okay. And then what happens is like I can, you can start to look at things and start to look for patterns. Okay. So for example, let, let's say that, uh, let's say that Steve is working on his next book and he's looking for all these patterns of maybe problems. He can start to do these screenshots of things that he's seeing. Like, okay, like let's say I'm seeing this problem or this problem, this problem. He can start to do this and that brings it into his key account. And then what happens is on the key account, he can start to, to rearrange these things and order them and group them for content creation or other, other like idea management. So it's a really cool web clipping tool. And at the same time, it, it allows you to organize your thoughts and ideas all onto this platform. Cool. That sounds interesting. That's really cool. Okay. So I'm actually going to test this out right now um, because I want to get the recalibration questions from Steve. So I'm going to go on to yastro.com. I just download the extension. And let's let's test this out. So I go to yaster.com forward slash ideas. And then I'm going to go to unleash your latent profit. And then I here's the PDF. And now I'm going to go to keep on this page. You're not logged in. Oh, come on. Keep with three E's, right? Yeah. Settings. Right. Help. All right. I think it'll be good. All right. I like this. Great tip of the week. But it's not as good as my tip of the week, Scott Todd. Not that it's a competition. <laughs> my tip of the week is learn more about Steve Yastro at yastro.com. Check out the books. Check out the ideas. Um, ditch the pitch. We, the ideal customer relationship. Brand harmony. Unleash your latent profit. This is well worth your time. Um, phenomenal. So, Steve, you asked you, is there anything that we should have asked you that we didn't ask you? Well, one thing we didn't talk specifically about is I know you've got a real estate focused audience here. Um, and I invite everybody to explore how these principles can work in various aspects of real estate. I know you've got people with varied interests. I've applied these. I mean, imagine you're trying to persuade somebody to do business with you, whether it's an investor, whether it's a tenant, whether it's somebody you trying to persuade to sell to you. These principles of ditching the pitch can help you in the real estate world in a very, uh, very tangible way. So that's my, my, in, my encouragement to your listeners is to try to take what they're learning from you guys and combine it with Ditch the Pitch and make some money. You know what? And speaking of improv, I just, you know, I listened to this audiobook and I loved it. And uh, I don't talk about it as a business book, but really it kind of applies in a weird, funny way is Bossy Pants by Tina Fey. Oh, okay, I got to read Bossy Pants. I haven't yet. Well, she talks a lot about uh, how phenomenal living your life is based on the principles of improv. Yes. And, and, yeah. and it's really funny. It's really great. And, and she talks a lot about her success in life has been based on these improv principles. You know, I try to live my life that way. So I'm going to read bossy pants next. Thanks for that tip. All right. Fantastic. I've seen the book around and uh, it's great. It's wonderful. I all right. I, well, I want to thank all the listeners and remind you, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Steve Astro from Astro.com is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, and you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of your review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. Um, again, today's podcast is sponsored by geekpay.io. Go there, check it out. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. Steve Astro, are we good? Yes, thank you very much, Scott and Mark. It was great to meet you guys. Talk to you soon, I hope. All right, thanks, everybody, and let freedom ring. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.